Here in just a second, we'll read from the Gospel according to Mark, and we will hear from an unnamed disciple of Jesus who says, Look what large stones and large buildings. There in Jerusalem, it's a common reaction the first time someone visits any big city, the tall buildings that are stacked one on top of another like big Giant Legos can take your breath away and remind you that you are small. Look what large buildings and large stones. In downtowns like Dallas is the sheer size of the large buildings, each of them formed by their definitive placement of large stones and steel girders and expansive glass panes. All of it is extraordinary. Yesterday, Sarah and Abraham and I spent the afternoon downtown walking around, and we were with Sarah's family, Stephen and Taryn and their three kiddos who were all here visiting with us for a few days, and we meandered through downtown soaking it all up. Once again, I was struck by the diversity of people on the sidewalks and the cars that were all stacked one behind each other on the streets and, and the buildings buildings rising up above it all. The city is more than the sum of its parts. That sidewalk makes no sense without the street, and the street's unnecessary without the large buildings, and the large stones are not interesting, no matter how big they are, unless they're stacked, one on top of the other, until their collective height teases the front doors of heaven. And when something looks like it has been here forever and it looks like it was constructed by God, it is hard, maybe even impossible, to imagine its destruction. Listen now for God's word as it comes to us from the gospel according to Mark chapter 13. As he came out of the temple, one of his disciples said to him, Look, teacher, what large stones and large buildings... And then Jesus asked him, Do you see these great buildings? Not one stone will be left here upon another. All will be thrown down. When he was sitting on the Mount of Olives opposite the temple, Peter, James, John, and Andrew asked him privately, Tell us, when will this be? What will be the sign that all these things are about to be accomplished? Then Jesus began to say to them, Beware that no one leads you astray. Many will come in my name and say, I am he, and they will lead many astray. And when you hear of wars and rumors of wars, do not be alarmed, this must take place, but the end is still to come. For nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. There will be earthquakes. In various places there will be famines. This is but the beginning of the birth pangs. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The title of the sermon today is Stone Tables. That disciple who speaks first in our text this morning sounds like a tourist. He he wasn't inviting an apocalyptic outburst. He, He didn't anticipate a detailed agenda for the end of time, he was not expecting his observation to summon an extended conversation about desolation and destruction and death. I believe that had he known his small talk would be returned with a somber prophecy that the tall buildings and the temple would be torn down, he might have bit his tongue and just kept on taking some pictures. Oh, he should have known. I'm not sure what the unnamed disciple was thinking when he tried to make small talk with Jesus because we're now 13 chapters into the Gospel of Mark and by this point, it is clear that Jesus does not do small talk. Uh, At dinner parties, he does exorcisms between the first and second course. And on afternoon walks outside... He curses fig trees. And on boat rides, when everyone else is talking about how choppy the water is, he gets out and he walks on it. 
He doesn't stop to say hello to strangers. He tells them to stop what they're doing and follow him. There's nothing in the gospel record indicating that Jesus was ever surprised by the size of anything. That chatty disciple should have known better when he said, look, teacher, what large stones and large buildings. The teacher wasn't impressed. The stones, he said, would all be thrown down. And the conversation promptly ends for a moment. The rest of the walk up to the Mount of Olives is a silent stroll. Nobody says anything. Nobody says a word until they reach the top and they stop to sit down. And from up there, they can see the stones that are stacked to make tall buildings. The stones that will all be thrown down. But Jesus never won to let an object pass without assigning some eternal significance to it, pronounces that the future of the large stones and the large buildings is certain, and the future is not promising. And one way that we can ease the discomfort of Jesus' words is to conclude that the tall buildings won't actually fall down, but the truth that they represent will. Either way, the metaphor or the real thing presents some problems for institutions that are known for stone stacking. You know, if you tilt your head just so and, and you squint your eyes, the, the Christian church can look like a collection of large stones stacked neatly upon each other to form irrepressibly large buildings that lean against each other, each fortifying the other like an indomitable expression of religious engineering that is destined to last forever and is immune to the forces of nature swirling around it or rumbling beneath it. And if you stare long enough through the lens of the gospel while Jesus is whispering in your ear that not one stone will be left here upon the other, all will be thrown down, then it's likely you will be alarmed. Earlier this year in April, Gallup released a poll that signaled a watershed moment in America for the first time since Gallup started asking adults in 1937 if they belonged to a house of worship Fewer than half said yes. Of those that were surveyed, 47% said they belonged to a church, synagogue, or mosque. Now, if you're confused as to why this poll is so alarming, just consider that in 1999, right at the turn of the century, 22 years ago, Gallup reported that 70% of the adult population living in America belonged to a house of worship. Between 1937 and 1999, that number, 70%, barely moved at all. You might want to blame it on the young, but the dramatic decline in religious membership over the last 20 years is present across all age groups, although the decline is most prominent among millennials or those between, born between 1981 and 1996. Only 36% of millenni millennials belong to a house of worship compared with 66% of traditionalists. That's the generation born before 1946. There weren't enough respondents from Generation Z, which is the youngest group of adults. But I found a report that was released three weeks ago from Springtide Research Institute on the spirituality of young people between the ages of 13 and 25. And that report indicates that religious affiliation is even less likely for the generation 
that was born about the same time America elected its first black president and came of age after the fight for marriage equality was won and during the movement for black rights and during a global pandemic. Only 16% of the 10,000 Gen Zers that responded said that they turn to someone in their religious community during challenging times. 60% said, quote, I don't believe some of the things I hear talked about at religious gatherings. 55% responded, quote, I don't feel like I can be my full self in a religious organization. 47% said, quote, I don't think religion, faith, or religious leaders will care about the things I want to talk about or bring up during times of uncertainty. Well, if Gallup or the Springtide Research Institute asked Jesus to respond to the alarming trends that are shaping the future of religion and the church, I think he would say, do you see these great buildings? Not one stone will be left here upon another. All will be thrown down. There are a number of weird websites and parachurch groups that are obsessed with the end of the world. There are charismatic pastors that claim to know exactly which wars and prophets, false prophets and famines and earthquakes coincide with the prophecies of Scripture, like the one that we encounter today. I will not take up our time arguing with any of those interpretations or predictions because the cataclysmic collision of earth and heaven predicted to happen at a specific time in the future is actually already happening. It's happening in real time right before our eyes and we might not even be noticing the once sturdy stones of orthodoxy are crumbling under the collective weight of our complacency about what it means to follow Jesus. And the once sturdy stones of sophisticated theologies are being turned upside down and examined to see if they bear the seal of the gospel. And the once sturdy stones of our public witness, they're being tested by inspectors inside and outside sanctuaries like this one for their utility their integrity, and their faithfulness. Do not be alarmed. This must take place. The end is still to come. I'd like to hear something besides do not be alarmed from Jesus. You know, the steady deconstruction is alarming. It can make us feel hopeless and helpless. What are we supposed to do beside stand with each other muttering, I told you so, under our breath? To whoever will listen. Or we might mutter, if they just do it my way, the tall buildings would still be standing. Some say the church is too intolerant. Others say that it's not tolerant enough. Some say the culture is changing and the church needs to be relevant. Others say the church should just stay put, not pay any attention to culture. You've got technologists that espouse the saving grace of a hyper-connected humanity served by the wonders of the World Wide Web and accessible broadband. And then you've got nostalgics that point to the enduring spiritual legacies of Saints like Julian of Norwich and Howard Thurman and Teresa of Avila that served faithfully without any live streaming equipment. 
I wish Jesus would just speak up and tell us what to do right now. I wish he'd say something to resolve the competing visions of how to save the church from its identity crisis so we can get on with the work of strengthening it to survive until the very end. And then we arrive to worship, the one place during the week when silence is forced upon us. And we hold it long enough to hear a voice that is crying out from the neighborhood of Bethlehem in the shadows of downtown. And we notice that he did say something. But it's not what we want to hear. He said, beware that no one leads you astray. Many will come in my name and say, I am he. And they will lead many astray. And when you hear of wars and rumors of wars, do not be alarmed. This must take place. The end is still to come. But do not be alarmed is not what we want to hear. I don't know about you, but I'd prefer an action plan, right? But if we can bear to set aside our attachments to memories of our church when we were young or visions of the church that we want to grow up old with, then Jesus' instruction to not be alarmed because it must take place might just be what we need to hear. Because do not be alarmed is not an excuse to do nothing. It's a reminder that this was not our church to save in the first place. You see, death is something that's common to the gospel story. And if we consider the timing of Jesus' prediction that it will all come tumbling down, then the fear that comes with not being in control may not paralyze us. The Gospel writer of Mark puts the exchange between Jesus and the disciples immediately before the Passion narrative and Holy Week. In the Gospel of Mark today, Jesus is on the doorstep of his own death when he predicts the destruction of tall buildings and the temple that stands resolutely in the line of his sight between where he is and the cross that he will bear. In his death, his death will signal the apparent destruction of the movement that he labored to build stone by stone. The crowds that appeared to be an irrepressible force in the countryside will desert him in the city. The disciples that journeyed with him across the countryside will deny that they know him in the city. One of them will betray him and disavow him, disavow the trust that that they once shared for just a little bit of money. The strange thing is Jesus knew all the denials and the desertions were coming. Death could not be avoided. Do not be alone. But he knew the movement that commenced with a simple, solitary baptism in the Jordan River and grew to assume a gravity of its own would soon lie desolate in the darkness of the tomb. Destruction was imminent. Everything that he thought would last forever would soon come tumbling down. The Son of God would die. Oh, what tall buildings and large stones. But do not be alarmed. This must take place. The end is still to come. And just when it feels like there's nothing left to do but wring our hands once more before calling it quits, In time to dodge the falling rumble, Jesus slips in the promise of resurrections to come right there at the end of our reading in verse 8 when he says, this is but 
the beginning of the birth pangs. Whoa, hold up. Did you hear that? Above the sound of stones rumbling, did you hear the Son of God say, this is but the beginning of birth pangs, which means, against all evidence to the contrary, including famines and earthquakes and wars and rumors of wars, something new is about to be born. And as the Bible tells me so, it is not a handy-dandy guide for church growth. And it is not longer sermons with bigger words. And it's not blueprints for how to stack stones better the next time around. According to the story that we claim as the Word of God made real in the person of Jesus Christ, it is His body that will be born again. And if it's His body, then it's our bodies also. Oh, the body of Christ will rise from the rumble, the body that bore the marks left behind when the religious authorities conspired with the Romans to crush him under the large stones of public shaming and state-sanctioned terror on a cross. The body of Christ that bore the sins of the world so we would be free from striving to hide our own the resurrected body of Christ did not go to the religious authorities to say, see, I told you so. According to Mark, on the other side of the tomb, the body of Christ appeared. First to the disciples as they were sitting at a table eating. The stones fell, and Jesus used one of them to set a table. And when I imagine us sitting with him at a table set on a fallen stone, then the tomb of the last two years, and the tomb of trying to be relevant to a world that should never confuse us as normal when we're following the way of Jesus in the tomb of despair for lives that we could not save and lonely people that we did not notice and injustice that we didn't confront. When we see Christ at a table set on a fallen stone, we can see now all the fallen stones waiting for us to host a meal or a conversation or a prayer for anyone that assumed God forgot about them. A frequent request that I get after preaching is that I give people who listen to the sermon, an action plan. They say, Amos, you don't give us actions, but tell us what to do this week. <laughs> well, this week, I've got one for you. This week, we'll be setting tables. My email address is ajd at fpcdallas.org. You can find it on the website. This week and in weeks to come, I'd like for you all to set a table on a fallen stone and invite somebody to come and join you. Share a meal with somebody that you don't normally talk to. Even better, share a meal that, with someone that maybe betrayed you, like the disciples betrayed Jesus. Acted like they don't know you or they quit talking to you when the going got tough like the disciples did to Jesus. Set a meal on a table made of stone and listen and show up. A 
is the body of Christ. Not perfect, but, you know, like Christ, scarred, wounded, even on the other side of the tomb, but still there, present. In the name of God, Creator, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen.